Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's 5.30, so we're going to get started. My name is Kathleen McLean. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here this evening for the public opening of Stephen Andrews, POV. Um, just some lay of the land remarks. This talk goes from 5.30 to 6.30. After that, you're invited to join us in Walker Court, where we're having an opening reception. Remarks in Walker are at 7 o'clock. Stephen will be signing copies of the catalog at 7.30. His exhibition is on the fourth floor of the gallery. Also, if anyone's missing a pearl, Stephen found this. <laughs> I have it, and I'm in the front row. For real, it's you? Okay, I'll, I'll get it to you in a second. Um, but now, it's my pleasure to introduce Kitty Scott, the Art Gallery of Ontario's Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, who will introduce Stephen. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, very nice to see everybody here. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit and then I'm going to talk a little bit. So, uh, my name is Kitty Scott. I'm curator of modern and contemporary art at the AGO. I would first like to welcome you and thank you for all joining us this evening at another of our series of public celebrations marking exhibitions of contemporary artists taking place in the gallery. Stephen Andrews, Point of View opens on the fourth floor of the Contemporary Tower this evening. I hope you will all get a chance to spend some time in the exhibition this evening. From the start of his artistic career, oops, sorry, <laughs> Stephen Andrews was born and raised in Sarnia, Ontario, and now lives and works in Toronto. The AGO is proud to host uh, his largest solo exhibition to date. From the start of his artistic career in the early 90s, Stephen Andrews has explored the politics of image making in a contemporary world gripped by crises that range from the geopolitical and environmental to the medical. Stephen Andrews' point of view focuses, for the first time, on his work of the last 15 years as the artist has fully embraced painting. He turns to this medium to further his long-standing investigation of the image in an era of conflict, trauma, and memory. Central to Andrews' work during this time has been his process of transforming images, most frequently found or produced through mechanical means, photography in all its contemporary forms, into the handmade medium of painting. What we are most used to viewing in a state of distraction on our televisions, computer screens, and mobile phones becomes the subject of a painstaking process of transcription. As viewers, as viewers we are asked to assume some of Andrew's own attention when we look at these paintings. Whether addressing global war or personal loss, they slow down our information-saturated observation, making room for memory, mourning, and glimpses of joy. Um, speaking of glimpses of joy, uh, it's been an absolute uh, joy and pleasure uh, to work with Stephen. Um, he's somebody I've known as an artist. I've known about Stephen for actually much longer than I've actually known Stephen. Whenever, when I was young and sort of starting off in curating, older curators would always mention his name, and it was with complete reverence what an amazing artist he is. And uh, people, other artists particularly also, like held him in very, very high regard. And I sort of got to know him slowly, probably in the kind of mid uh, to late 2000s, I would see him here and there and uh, met him and started talking with him. And it wasn't really until I started working here at the AGO that I became sort of deeply involved in the work. Um, I, I knew his work to some degree, um, but I can say I really know it now. And um, every day that I spent with Stephen working on the show has been uh, fantastic. Um, it's been a real pleasure uh, to work with. He's an amazing man. Uh, an amazing artist, and I think you'll go upstairs and you'll see what he's been up to in the last 15 years, and I think you'll uh, feel the same way I do. I hope you do. Okay, Stephen. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. It's sort of like the gang's all here. <laughs> the biographical notes, I think everybody knows. <laughs> Um, I'm not really a man of mystery to most of you. Um, uh, working with Kitty has been amazing. Uh, putting together 15 years of work, it's, it's hard to sort of pull out things. There are probably 100 works for every work that we've selected, so um, it's kind of the greatest hits, but um, see for yourself. Uh, this is gonna be the speed dating version of my career. So 
I hope you like me at the end of it. So the, uh, <clears throat> um, I like to begin in 1990, 1993, uh, with a work called Facsimile. Um, this was at the moment uh, in the AIDS crisis that it arrived in full force in Toronto. And it's at that moment that we begin really losing people like every week. Um, in 1988, 89, there wasn't uh, an AIDS memorial at that point in time. Um, so what I wanted to do was uh, a memorial piece. There was a lot of stigma involved with uh, HIV at that point in time. And people were very reluctant about disclosing even their loved ones' names because of that stigma. It was only bad people, like homosexuals and drug addicts had uh, HIV, so uh, this is uh, a work of love. I never actually thought about it as a work of art. It was about um, addressing my own memory. And it began as a series of faxes. I was in Europe at the time, and I asked uh, my partner, Alex, at that time, uh, if he would send me uh, the, some names of people because uh, I was, had originally started as a naming project. But what he did was he sent me a fax of the Proud Life section of Extra Magazine. And what astounded me was that the technology itself forgot the images. So it was almost like the technology stood in for us and our own forgetfulness. And so what I did was painstakingly reproduce uh, that forgetfulness. So these are uh, encaustic and oil. And uh, is this how this works? Oh, the arrow. OK, great. See technology. Um, <laughs> these <laughs> drawings are done in a similar format to the funeral portraits of ancient Egypt, the Fa Fayum portraits. Um, they look like they're spit out of a machine in about 10 seconds, but in fact, some of these more articulated ones are about uh, two days in the making. So, oh, wrong way. The, the tracery of their making is sort of left on the, the bottom of the image. You'll see kind of little flecks, because what I've done is I've covered a surface in oil and started uh, scratching out the drawing pixel by pixel. Uh, this is the first time that I started drawing the means of transmission as well as the content itself. And there was something that fascinated me that the world is brought to us through filters, and this is the first time I drew the filter as well as the, the portrait. So you see this is Peter McGee. He was an author um, in Toronto at the time. Uh, occasionally, the technology itself completely forgot the image, but I use these things as placeholders. Uh, they are lined up. There's 148 portraits in total, and they um, are named on the bottom, with uh, stamped onto sheet music. I wanted to use music, but because it is so evocative and so emotive, I really wanted to pull my punches. So you need music in a memorial, but I didn't want to uh, pull on the heartstrings of the viewer. So I just indicate music by using player piano, which is a digitalized, early digitalized version of uh, music uh, notation. Um, uh, what you'll see upstairs, I'm sort of fast forwarding to the present right now, is um, some pots. What we've included in the exhibition are ceramics, paintings, photography, and animation. Um, I started doing pots about three years ago. And I thought I would put them after this selection of uh, portraits from the facsimile series because um, there is a play on words in Hebrew for clay. And the first man. Adam is a play on words for Adama, which is clay in uh, Hebrew. So there is something, a correlation between the pot, the vessel, and the, the body. 
And I wanted to kind of put this up front because as I start talking about the work in the POV exhibition, you'll see that there is a relationship between the body, the figure, and the subject uh, ground, or figure ground relationships. So uh, again, thinking about sort of the vessel and turning it inside out, here the sort of filigree becomes the sort of sinews of the body sort of on the outsides of the pots. Uh, they are based on uh, the organic form, which are uh, nutmeg, the way uh, mace grows around nutmeg. So uh, like an orange, that sort of filigree that's inside the peel um, is what mace is to nutmeg. So. My pots are completely useless. <laughs> <laughs> You'd never be able to put anything in them. They've even got holes. Um, after the facsimile, uh, piece, it had been a, a project, of an investigation into line. So <clears throat> with the digital, uh, with the, the work in the 80s, I was interested in sort of paring things down, trying to make things essential. And you'll see that as part of the project as I go along, even to this day, trying to find a way of reducing everything down to something that is essential. And I do that with my own subjectivity. I try to find what is a key thing in my own subjectivity from which I work that I share with all of you. So um, rather than kind of bogging down in my own subjectivity, and there's a certain opacity to this, the, uh, the nuances of our subjectivity, I try to just find those things that we share and work from there, that point of view. These are, thinking about the line, if we reduce the line to a pixel, we're kind of at this end game. So what I had thought, okay, where can I move from the, the facsimile pieces? Well, I sort of thought of the ones and zeros of the fax transmission as this kind of the zero being a lens. And through it, we switch the focal point and turn upside down and start moving back out into the world. So these are digital portraits, like the facsimile ones, only they're actual fingerprints. So using the digit as a, as a literalized uh, uh, metaphor. So I just do these little drawings in uh, oil and then make monoprints from the drawings onto another piece of paper using my finger. So in some ways, it's about seeing myself in others. So the, the index of my own identity, my, the forensic evidence of my being here, the fingerprint, is sort of mapped onto uh, the portraits of all of those people around me. Um, around 1996, uh, the new uh, cocktail came online for those of us with HIV and uh, opened a door. What was kind of amazing about that particular moment is people had jumped up and down and screamed and yelled and actually got drugs into bodies. Um, it's kind of a miracle that that happened, I mean. <laughs> and from that moment on, I was truly sold on the idea of activism, that in fact, you can make a change. And so, the work that was associated with this particular moment was having achieved those goals, what next, okay? So a lot of us who had been working sort of for these ends found ourselves at a moment where we were at loose ends. And so I started to think about figure ground relationships as a way to try and articulate this moment. Because I'm always trying to find some way to represent what I feel is going on in the zeitgeist. Um, so I started doing these drawings of crowds. At the time, um, what was happening in the headlines here in Toronto were the days of action. So the conservative government had gotten into power here in the province on the common sense revolution platform. And what I think shocked everybody was they actually started to do what they said they were going to do. And so we had a used car salesman who was the Minister of Transportation. We had a high school dropout who was the Minister of Education. And 
the streets were filled with people that were, you know, freaking out. And so from those headlines, from the pictures in the paper, and in combination with um, the activism and the, where I felt we were at in terms of that activism, these kind of things coalesced into these drawings of crowds. How I began to think about them is, as I said, in terms of figure ground re relationships. So suddenly, the subject of the picture is not the picture itself or what's represented in the picture, but the viewing of the picture itself. So the crowd in the picture looks out at you and is waiting for you to do something. It's this sort of expectation of the audience for the viewer to perform. So it's a call to action in some ways. You'll see uh, kind of the penultimate articulation of it upstairs in the show. Um, it's the piece I did as a study for the Trump Tower mosaic. Um, these are all quite small, these pieces. And uh, what you'll see upstairs is a six foot by 24 foot version of this. So uh, hop, skipping, and jumping along. Here we are in 2001, which is the last piece that was in the survey show, uh, my previous survey show, so the first 15 years of my career. And this is the starting point for uh, this new show. So I didn't really want to do a, a retrospective because I wasn't ready to be put out to pasture. So I, I asked Kitty if we could sort of start uh, at this particular point in time. And it seemed this, this really interesting kind of punctuation. I mean, the world really did change in 2001. Um, so it, they were in this world, and I new world, and I don't believe it's a brave one, but <laughs> here we are nonetheless. But this piece um, marks the, the end of the first part, if you will. So I had, you know, my health was collapsing. Um, I ended up on the medications. And this resurrection, I found myself Lazarus-like, sort of staring into the abyss that is the future. And it was um, quite daunting. It took me about four years to kind of grapple with um, how to begin again. And it's <clears throat> the way I began to think about the articulation or representation of what that might be, how I might begin again, how I might be resurrected, was through love. So seeing myself uh, in the jewel-like eyes of the beloved, that's how I kind of came back to life again. So I did a, a film, uh, a film, uh, which is playing on the idea of the trim bin and the old analog way of editing films. So these are all oversized film strips. Each frame is about like this. And it's a quotation of Jarman, Warhol, uh, Brackage. Um, these are all uh, experimental filmmakers. Some of them you know, some of them you may not. Um, and it's a love story. So it's about me falling in love with John, who is my muse, <laughs> and probably much to his chagrin, because I'm always sticking a camera in his face. Um, so as it, as it goes along here, I'll just go back. It begins with this, this crowd sequence, kind of what I had thought of as the old work. And I set it on fire and burn it up, and then the, the film begins again. And I drew a soundtrack, which you'll see here, these little black strips. I recorded myself reading Ann Carson's uh, uh, Lazarus Part Two, and uh, just sort of drew the sound. And then we begin with the regular film, the countdown, um, a kind of a diamond sequence, which I thought of as the, the credit sequence and then uh, zooming in on the eye of, of John and seeing myself reflected there. Um, I got some details. Oh, the very beginning of the film is um, from something that John shot in uh, India of me blowing up these giant balloons until they exploded in my face. <laughs> so you, you see the last shot here just before the, the uh, balloon goes. So. Again, here's a detail of the crowd. So these are graffiti drawings and 
photocopy transfers. So I'm using techniques that I used earlier, just sort of updating them. So the facsimile drawings were sgraffito drawings. I just kind of came up with a new way of doing that. Sgraffito is where you cover a surface in a, in a in sort of black ink or something and then scratch away the drawing. Um, here's that figure of me sort of extremely close in the iris. There's John, I did a, a large painting which you'll see upstairs of that. Um, there's a kind of a funny story behind this. This is uh, a sex scene. Um, it's Joe D'Alessandro um, bottoming and <laughs> which I think he denies, but this is evidence. Uh, a friend of ours had, a, I don't know, a bootleg second, third, fourth generation videotape, which we made another generation copy of. And I took frame grabs out of it. When I first showed this in Vancouver, one of the curators came later, who was showing it at the next venue and kind of freaked out and said, what about the children? And I said, well, aren't the children all about all this stuff? But anyway, she said, well, uh, I don't know if we can show it. And I said, well, I'll censor it then, which flipped her out even more. I, was, I couldn't possibly ask you to do that. Um, but I said, no, no, it'll be fine. It's OK. And probably make it even hotter. <laughs> and <laughs> so I overlaid all the naughty bits with these little round circles. And if you know my work, you know the dot is kind of central to a lot of what it is that I do, especially in the last 15 years. Uh, so they just float over top of the images. And don't you know that the kids, when they came to the exhibitions, were like lifting up the flaps and giggling and carrying on. So there you go. Uh, this is a, a quote of Jarman's uh, last film, Blue. Um, it's just television screen, uh, blue screen, blue. And the idea of this whole piece, which is divided up into three sections, the first is the end, the second is the first part of the second half, and the last part is the beginning. And the blue screen, blue sort of represents this background, this future against which anything can take place. And it's about that promise uh, that I wanted to end uh, that piece. Um, this is where we begin uh, the show, POV. POV, for those of you who don't know, is a point of view. Um, my interest in it as a, a word is that it's pretty open-ended. It's sort of mysterious, POV, what's that? Any gamer might know, but I've had a few people ask me what it means. Uh, for me, other than point of view, it's also a point, a point of view. Uh, an editorial point of view, a beginning. It is also just formally the point, the pointless things that make up paintings like this. Um, there's, I, I can't remember, I counted at one point in time how many dots are on this painting. It was begun on the 10th of December, or 10th of September uh, 2001, so just the day before 9-11. Um, it's, it was sort of important to keep busy <laughs> After that, I, I know a lot of us who were very freaked out by the events of 9-11 and didn't really know how to respond. Um, for me, because I had begun this very labor-intensive painting, um, it was a great way to kind of keep busy. It's almost like a, a Tibetan sand painting, only the trick of it is it's in oil, so the master can't come along later and run his stick through it. But um, it is also represents kind of a marker. So for me, this piece is kind of the table of contents for the show upstairs. Um, it's about labor. And for me, labor is about being. I mean, the making of things, the process of making things is essential to what it is that I do. And it's kind of what I think living is all about. It's about doing and being simultaneously. And making art is an engagement with that where you are working from your subjectivity, but to make it, you have to kind of get out of your head and just execute it. You can't be conscious of what it is that you're doing while you're doing it. Um, 
I do this weird thing when I'm working. I run my tongue back and forth across my lips. And I usually think it's about time to stop working when like, the whole front of my face is numb. So, they, um, so I would just sit. I worked with uh, Paul P. on some of these. He sat there. It was almost like a quilting bee, uh, <laughs> the two of us stamping these dots. Um, it also speaks to the butterfly effect paintings, which you'll see later in the show. Um, there's a, a shift. It's using photomechanical reproduction. This is the first time I'm really using color. Um, and I really needed a system like I did with facsimile. So I had the technology of facsimile as a way to kind of approach the representation. Here, as I'm beginning to work with color exclusively, I need the uh, system which I use, uh, the photomechanical reproduction system. Uh, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And that was good because the colors were chosen for me. I didn't have to choose them. But as you combine them, and those of you who know about color theory and color combinations, you can produce all of the colors using those four colors. Um, the, the sort of, I guess, conceit of this piece is that it looks like it was printed, and it's off register. but I painted the off register. And when you look at the butterfly effect paintings, it's playing again with this idea of registration. Um, similarly, around that time, I was working with uh, uh, Turner. I was looking at Turner paintings and really kind of fascinated by the light in them. And these two paintings in particular, this first one and this second one, are his paintings before and after the deluge. And these were done just shortly after 9-11. And they became this kind of nice allegory for um, what the events of September. So I just um, looked at the, the reproductions in the book and blew them up as if you're looking, uh, looking really closely at the, the photographic reproductions of the paintings. Again, it starts to <clears throat> bring into the work the, representation, the photographic representation and the play that I do with that in painting. Um, you'll remember from the first part of the second half, the, the movie. Um, this is what I had thought of at the time as the movie poster for the movie. So using the kind of the look of photomechanical reproduction to uh, reproduce images from the film that were supposed to be the, the publicity for it. Um, painting like thousands and thousands of dots is ridiculous. So I really had to find a new way. Um, I was in New York, and I had a kind of an epiphany. I was thinking, oh, photo screens. Well, what if I just literalized that and made use window screens? And I thought, get me home. I've got to figure this out. And so I, I got home a couple days later, and I, I had some screening around, lying around the studio. And I dropped a piece of paper over the screen, and I just went like this with a crayon. And suddenly I had hundreds and hundreds of dots <laughs> in about one second. <laughs> And it was that eureka moment that freed me from the, <laughs> the labors of doing these paintings. Um, it was also at that time that the, <clears throat> the media was almost like the Ministry of Information for the government. It was um, after the invasion of Afghanistan and um, just after uh, the troops went into Iraq. Um, there were no images of collateral damage in the papers. Um, the, what happened after 9-11 is we sort of signed away our rights. And um, I mean, people talk about Bill C-51 now um, as if you know, this is our rights and our privacy being infringed upon. Basically, it's just housekeeping. I mean, the rights were all signed away shortly after 9-11 with uh, the, the security measures acts that kind of were enacted both here and in the States. Um, what I wanted to do was sort of show the lie of um, uh, media coverage of the war. So I uh, started doing these drawings 
um, based on images that I found on the internet um, that weren't available in the mainstream press. So this is a shot from a video of a BBC cameraman uh, filming um, an event during a friendly fire uh, event. And his blood is on the lens while he's um, filming. These drawings all have very elaborate, almost news-like captions to tell you what you're looking at, because you might just think you're looking at a day at the beach. Um, so it, it's this sort of disconnect between the signifier and the signified. So we're looking at these pictures in the paper, and we really do need the backstory to kind of flesh them out. And it's um, something that I kind of investigate again and again in the series. Um, this is uh, two patients that were being transferred while their ambulance was blown up. And so the hospital was kind of full and they didn't, uh, they were just sort of in the floor in the, the emergency. These images were uh, gathered from a number of different sites, soldiers' blogs, which for some reason were going uncensored. Um, I don't really know why because the Pentagon invented the internet and that they didn't see soldiers' blogs as this security breach <laughs> is kind of beyond me. It took them to Abu Ghraib to figure it out. But until that time, you had access to soldiers' blogs, and they were full of trophy photographs. Um, uh, this was actually published in a Danish newspaper. It's soldiers uh, having stripped civilians and made them walk across a public park. So it sort of shows the lie of Abu Ghraib. I think the, the PR people for the Pentagon led us to believe that there was um, only this isolated incident of hazing-like behavior in the prison. And <clears throat> in fact, it was going on all over the place. Uh, this is one of the first images of a prisoner in uh, Guantanamo Bay. The <clears throat> I think when I first showed some of these things in New York, people were having false memory stuff because I remember people saying, oh, I remember seeing that thing in the paper. And I was just like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, th this image has come to light. Uh, after it wasn't, I think, one of the original, I, I may be wrong here, but I don't think it was one of the original set of 11 photographs that was uh, released. Uh, I actually wept after I drew this picture. Um, I started going a little kookier with the color. The, this is called Orange Alert. These are smaller drawings. It's a uh, police in London. Uh, after the bombing, there was, at that moment in time, there were so many color alerts, I couldn't keep it straight. So this was an orange alert. This is uh, red shadows. Um, in case you're falling asleep, I thought I would wake you up with this. was the war for oil. Um, I had done some other animations at the time, but I thought, what are we fighting for? We're fighting for gasoline for our cars. And I thought, what is the epitome of this culture right now? And it's the car commercial. 
more money is spent per second on a car commercial than just about anything else, like a, even one of those $200 million budget films doesn't compare to the per second expenditures on a car commercial. Uh, so what I wanted to do with this one was kind of unpack that idea. And <clears throat> so the car run, there's a, there's a number of points of view, POVs in this. You are behind the wheel. You are the deer in the headlights as a young AS, young guy of soldiering age. And you are actually the deer that gets hit. So we are all th three things. Um, so it's, for me, about understanding and um, addressing our own contradictions in terms of that conflict. Um, the images that I did do of the war are about the view from the armchair. I'm not a war artist. I didn't go to war. But what I was interested in doing was picturing our position here and how we receive the news and our relationship to it and our contradictions. So it was about trying to get at that, at that um, distanciation that we live with um, every day. Um, the last series, or the last uh, images I did in the series are these larger drawings, which you'll see upstairs. This is London bombing. Um, I'm interested in sort of a story as complicated as the London bombing story, which we heard about quite quickly after it, it happened. Not, or the truth of it. With something like the weapons of mass destruction story, that went on for years, and there was denials, and more information, and more denials. And after about, I don't know, two years of it, they finally admitted to the fact that there weren't any. And everyone was over it. Um, yeah, right, OK, we knew that. But with the London bombing story, all of the sort of machinations of the police department and the authorities and the different stories all came to light within about a week of one another. Um, there was a cop. He was watching the, the suspect, but he was peeing at the time. The guy left the building, so they followed him. He jumped the turnstile. That's why we shot him nine times. Um, <clears throat> you know, the bombs went off in the, the underground, the bombs went off in the bus, and this is the picture that they used to do to illustrate the story. So it was this kind of weird disconnect that somehow this image, out of the millions of images that there might have been, represents this story. And I kind of just went, <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> And so I just thought, OK, I need to spend the time and unpack this image and, and work on it and see what, what it produces. Um, if we think of this time period uh, that the show is about, so this 15 years from 2001 to 2015, it's <clears throat> pretty much about a life lived during this period in time. So the works are sort of artifacts of the thinking that went into making the works, but also about the time of which they were being made. Um, and what I wanted to do with the show in consultation with Kitty was to create a kind of a microcosm version of it. So I did a piece called uh, A Dot Went for a Walk, which exists as a blog. But it's a record of a journey, which is a word that I mostly hate, but uh, I haven't found a better one yet. Um, and you can think of it in metaphorical terms as a life, blah, 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 blah. But um, we, I really wanted to go over the surface of the planet and to understand, one, the scope of the planet, but also just how cultures dovetail together. If you get on a plane, pull yourself out of this culture, and plunk yourself down in another culture, you just don't understand the logic of how these things can exist, kind of. How, do, how did you get from? North America to China, like what are the different subtleties that sort of create these differences? So the trip was about trying to see that. So it starts in Toronto. This is the Toronto Ferry. Um, we sailed across the Atlantic on a schooner. So this is uh, taken mid-Atlantic. Um, 
This is John in St. Petersburg. This is uh, us in Pinyao. And so you see these kind of circle motifs, the dots in the censorship thing. The, the, the dot here is something that attracted me. Um, <clears throat> so the, the trip was quite interesting um, for me because I found my face. We ended up going back along the Silk Road. We spent a month going sort of from China back along the Silk Road to Tajikistan, Pakistan border. And I found that that's where my face comes from. It's this mix of kind of Caucasian, Asian, South Asian, I mean, all kind of coming together. And I kind of started thinking about Canada as this kind of new Silk Road. And if you don't know, my family is quite mixed, and it sort of represents all these kind of racial groups, if you will. And they all kind of blend together in this kind of marvelous way. Uh, so I guess that's what the journey was for me. It's about finding a kind of a place of belonging. Not that I belong at the border of Tajikistan and Pakistan and China, but <laughs> that, you know, somehow that the idea of that mixing kind of transports itself here to home. And, um, this is a painting called The View From Above. It's at a party at the top of the uh, Bank of Montreal uh, during 2008. Do I need to say any more? It's kind of like Nero fiddles while Rome burns. This is actually in the lobby at the TD Tower right now. Um, I just finished this, I guess, a few months ago. Sort of a selfie at the top. There's a lot of selfies in it. I think <laughs> in this work, uh, at this point in time, everyone looks at art through their camera. So I started thinking, oh, well, why don't I make paintings of selfies? There's something kind of perverse about that. So, uh, this is called uh, You and I. Andy, you might recognize it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is uh, My Shadow on John. This is almost like uh, two of the four seasons. The older guy, he really has that sort of, you know, old guy gait. And the younger guy has that real cock of the walk thing. Um, I started doing a lot of images of what I call X-Men, um, this army of guys who are in the process of transforming our city. Uh, they have these safety vests on everywhere, and somehow we don't notice them. Uh, I like the idea of the X-Men. It's sort of a marked man. It has all this kind of significance. But what I was trying to do with the new paintings is find something poetic in the quotidian. So something that had a little resonance if you wanted to go there, but really was just a picture in and of itself with, with or without the reading. So um, the intersection is kind of the, the metaphor that goes through all of this work. You find yourself at this threshold. You're looking at the painting. The painting's looking back at you. You're standing in front of a, a railway, roll, rail, blah, 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 blah. you know what I mean? The, the railroad crossing, it's almost as if you are Robert Johnson down at the crossroads uh, making some pack. So I've started to make pictures of this uh, point of passage, if you will. Uh, this piece is called Sarnia, my hometown. Um, thinking again about the war for oil and the idea of home. My dad planted that tree, actually. I didn't know that until I went home and showed him the photographs when, after I'd taken it, he goes, oh, I planted that tree. I'm just like, okay, that's a picture I'm going to paint. Um, here is the larger version of a crowd piece which you'll see upstairs is called The View From Here. 
There's a detail of it. When I think about um, the putting the pots in the show and how they go with painting, and it, it might seem like a bit of a stretch, but if you think of taking uh, base metals and grinding them into oil, they're almost like a mud that we kind of spread onto canvas and, and make an image from. And similarly with throwing a pot, you're taking this kind of base metal, this earth, and forming it into a pot. So the, the impulse is very, very similar. And I think that's, for me, this, this point of connection between the work and between all the work. It's about the making of the thing and the discovery through making. Um, I'm going to show you my secrets. So this is the painting that's upstairs uh, in its uh, initial stage. So I'm going to show you the different stages of the making of these paintings. Um, I do an underdrawing. It's called a, normally with a, a glaze painting, you would do a fully articulated a painting in gray called a grisai. Um, I can't be bothered. So I just do a drawing <laughs> in gray. Um, these are close-ups of the painting, uh, but uh, when you go upstairs, you'll see it. Uh, so I drop a blue on top of it, or a cyan, kind of like printing. These paintings have to be painted flat because the paint itself is just liquidy. Uh, so the drawing helps, you know, when you're leaning over these things. Um, here's the magenta on top. And uh, it's sort of pared down, this explanation. There's a lot of kind of tinkering as I go along. Like, uh, there's not just one layer of magenta. There are several, and I go in and touch up different areas. And, uh, make the color a little bit denser. Sorry, that's a bit blurry, but that's the only shot I had of the application of the yellow. Uh, there's a secondary blue because, as you see, it's quite red-orange, so I needed to kind of tone it down a bit. So I dropped another uh, blue on top and then start putting in the darks. And then you end up with the final painting. So there's like how to make a painting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another one, spectacle. Uh, this was a, a concert that Glenn and I went to. It's uh, uh, Grace Jones singing Hurricane as uh, Hurricane Sandy is bearing down on New York. It was quite special. Um, uh, the way I apply the paint is with sheets of plastic or credit cards or a bunch of different ways. I, uh, before I started painting, I went out and bought a How to Make a Painting book. And I was walking down the street and ran into Ben Portis, who used to be a curator here. And he said, oh, what you got there? And I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he goes, no, no, come on, come on. I was just like, oh, OK. As I show up, it's like, you know the most banal, like John Nagy or whatever his name was, how to make a painting. And uh, it said that you can use anything to put paint on a canvas. And that was really what I learned from that book. It was licensed to do whatever I felt like. And so that's what I do. I put the, the paint on in any number of ways, almost never with a brush. Um, what you get are these pockmarked surfaces. And What's interesting to me about these pockmark surfaces is they're the same over all the paintings, but depending on the content of the painting, you read them in different ways. So they can be dust motes, they can be the corroded uh, emulsion of an old photograph, they can be uh, snowflakes, uh, any number of things, depending on what the picture is of, you read them in different ways. Um, this is people looking at my paintings. These are eight foot by six foot paintings. Some, you can look at them this close because there are these kind of abstract moments in the paint. I, I, I like this. Paul took this photograph at one of the art fairs and it looks like people being beamed up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, this is my assistant Kyle and I uh, reflected in one of the new paintings. Um, I just finished the paintings this January, March, 
something like Xavier and Frederick Marx, something like that. And so seeing them for the first time out of the studio in the galleries has been interesting. As when I first walked in and saw them, I thought, oh my god, they're so exuberant and you know, bright and colorful. But then I realized at the end, there's this kind of heart of darkness. So using all of the techniques that I've done to make the figurative paintings, I've kind of essentialized it. I've just taken blocks of color and laying them on top of one another. Um, the titles of them, Butterfly Effect, comes from the idea of chaos theory, where one small action can produce an amazingly different large outcome. So a butterfly can flap its wings in the Azores, and a hurricane ensues in the Caribbean. So what I um, was thinking about was sort of things that had gone on in my life. I just, you know, I broke my ankle. I'd step, you know, an inch this way instead of that way, and I broke my ankle. What if I'd done the opposite? Would that have come out? If John had left for Egypt a day earlier, <laughs> would that have happened? And so I wanted to create a kind of a painting game to deal with that subjectivity. And so just laying down these colors in different ways, you produce completely different paintings. So um, this is the, the beginning of a project. Um, I'm not going to do the spoiler and show you the ones that are upstairs. I'm going to leave something for you to see. Um, but <laughs> Uh, I am redoing facsimile um, 20 some odd year, 25 years later. Uh, these are the same format as those portraits. And each one is different. So I'll do uh, a name, uh, like a, a portrait for every one of the, the pieces in the original in this way. And I've been reading something recently about the naming of the colors. And there are uh, moods or uh, descriptions of moods that are associated with the naming of all the colors. And I thought, oh, somehow I can make a selection of all of these images done in this different way and see people's characters as I remember them in them. So whether they were, you know, uh, more of a kind of a darker person or whether they were uh, kind of a more lively person or you know, whether they were anxious or any of those kinds of things, I could maybe look at these colors and interpret them in a particular way and then associate them with a name. So um, that's kind of hot off the press. I don't really know if that's exactly what I'm doing, but it's usually through the making of things that I discover what it is that I'm doing. Um, my little sound bite line about it is, my intuition is my seeing eye dog. It always gets me to where I need to go, but I just never knew I wanted to get there. So um, that's my intention with these. We'll see how it goes. But you see how just shifting things ever so slightly, you produce completely different paintings. I guess, too, when you see yourself in them, they become a portrait of you. Um, this piece is called Heaven, and it's a painting I painted for Susan. Uh, that's where I'd like to end it, so I'm not sure how my time is. That'll be good. We have time for a couple of questions, so if anybody has any. Or not. Was the talk okay? okay? <laughs> I think what we can do is um, let you think of questions, um, find Susan upstairs at the reception and walk record and ask him there. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, Walker Court is our next move. And Stephen, thank you very much. For thank you. Thank you.